Amen, church. For the past couple of months, we've been delving into a very intriguing study of the book of Luke. The first nine chapters, Luke has tried to lay out the most fundamental of all questions. Who is Jesus? And the answer from heaven and the answer from men is, he is the Son of God. Today, we begin the second third of the book. And it's called the journey section. From chapter 9, verse 51, through chapter 19, verse 44. One of the most famous of all scripture is recorded for us in the book of John, in chapter 14, in verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. One cannot take Jesus as a mere prophet. Either he is a false prophet and a liar, or indeed he is the Son of God. Interestingly enough, in Luke's second book, the companion book to the book of Luke, the book of Acts, Luke lays out that the primary name of the early disciples was the way. They were followers of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. It's recorded six times in that book. Most interestingly, in Acts 22.4, Paul himself, in sharing about his conversion, says, I persecuted the followers of the way to the death. And then later, in his defense before Felix, in chapter 24, verse 14, he says, I admit... I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way. And so John, I think very interestingly, captures it in a verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now Luke is going to expand upon it. And so we're going to begin the journey section in chapter 9 beginning in verse 51. And for the casual observer, one would think this was simply the recorded journey of Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem. Careful study, you'd actually find he goes back and forth three or four times. But the way that Luke is writing this is to get us to understand that Jesus is on a journey. The way. The way to Jerusalem the way of rejection, the way of death, but the way of salvation. Let's turn to chapter 9. As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messages on ahead who went into the Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. Thank God for his grace. Amen, guys. It is significant that in the beginning of the journey section that Jesus enters Samaria. And here these outcasts of Judaism even reject Jesus. And you'll find in the journey section, it begins with rejection. And it ends with rejection in Jerusalem. Our first point is simply, the way is a narrow invitation. Remember the words of Jesus where he said, straight and narrow is the way, and few that be that find it. Let's see why he said that. Verse 57. 
as they were walking along the road. So they're in the way. Amen, guys? A man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus is saying, I'm in the way. I'm going to Jerusalem. I have no place to lay my head. I have no home here. My home is in Jerusalem. My home is with the Father. Are you with me? He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. She said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Right here we see that as we are in the way, part of our first priority in seeking first the kingdom is to proclaim it. Now, very interestingly, at first glance, he says something impossible. Let the dead bury the dead. A dead guy can't get up and bury another dead guy. But a spiritually dead guy can. A spiritually dead guy who's not in the way, who's not moving towards Jerusalem, can stop and bury the dead because his priority is not the proclamation of the kingdom. Verse 61. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first, first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. See, you cannot look back if you're in the way. If you're plowing and you look back, you just begin to get off the way. Do you see what we're saying right here? And of course, we're reminded about Genesis 19 when Lot's wife looked back and was turned to a pillar of salt. You know, the Bible actually is full of passages about looking back. And when you think about it, when people look back, they no longer have their eyes set on Jerusalem, God, and salvation. But they're looking back, and what are they looking back at? Well, their past life, as well as their past doctrine. You know, it's very interesting to me, as many of us have known in our former fellowship, so many who embraced the confession, Jesus is Lord, began to look back. And then, what did they do? They lost confidence in their spiritual family, and so what did they do? They moved back to be with their physical family. They went back. Back home. Others, when they look back, they look back at not only their past life, but their past doctrine. They move back to the doctrine where, as a child, they found comfort. And so go back to false teachings about salvation, or even to their roots in the mainline church. You know, this past couple of days, I had the opportunity to go visit our sister church in Phoenix, the Phoenix International Christian Church. And therein lies the most incredible story of grace and the fact that even if you look back, if you repent, God will let you get back in the way. For many that don't know, about two and a half years ago, a couple that used to serve in the ministry here in Los Angeles, Chris and Sonia Klopek, they had gone from Los Angeles when they were let go of the ministry, and they went back to Phoenix, Chris's home, where his mom and his dad lived. Well, they were still going to church, but they began looking back, and their church attendance became more and more sporadic. And their marriage started to dissolve because their marriage was based on God. It got so bad that they separated for a while. Chris stayed in Phoenix where his parents lived. And Sonia went back home all the way to South Africa to be with her family. Well, time passed. And they did decide to get back together and make another try of it. They decided to try to put God first. But when they went back to church they found that the church that they were in was lukewarm. And they knew that if they were going to make it, they had to find a fellowship where the Spirit was alive and powerful and could get them in the way. And they started to hear good and bad about this little church in Portland. 
And so they decided to visit. And when they came, they saw, wow, this is the church I was baptized into. And they said, you know, we've got to do something. Well, they tried to go back and change things in the present situation that they got, but there was no changing things. And so they made an incredibly bold move. They decided to step out. Another couple immediately followed. And they started two and a half years ago with just four people, the Phoenix International Christian Church. A week later, their next door neighbor got baptized. That's Trinity. That's a pretty cool name, amen, you know. Well, the, the amazing thing is now, here it is two and a half years later, and every Sunday they have well over a hundred. And when I was there Friday night, I mean, the place was just on fire for God. Now, we had sent the Sullivans on down there with a mission team of 14, and it really strengthened the church on up. And it was amazing because Chris and Ta Sonia took a step back and said, listen to something, we need to be discipled again. And so Matt and Helen poured their lives into them. And you would not believe Chris and Sonia. I mean, they have taken a stand. They realize that now the Holy Spirit is calling the Sullivans down to lead the church in Santiago. And so they believe... And we believe, too, the Holy Spirit is lifting them on up. Well, in order for them to go in the ministry, they have now decided to sell their home of over a million dollars and go in the ministry and live in a very frugal lifestyle. Secondly, in the past year or so, in going back, God has blessed them because Chris's dad has gotten baptized. And just three weeks ago, his mom got baptized. But they're divorced, but now because they're in the kingdom of God, they can love each other as friends and brothers and sisters, and that's only going to be in God's true kingdom. Are you with me right here? And now the most exciting thing was, on Friday night, Chris and Sonia were reinstated as an evangelist and woman's ministry leader in the kingdom of God. You see, they understood that, that when they got out of the way... The Lord left them, and they turned back to their old life and doctrine. But by God's grace, he didn't rain down fire from heaven. They repented, and now they're leading the Phoenix International Christian Church. Yes, the way is a narrow invitation, but it's a way that's paved by the grace of God. Let's move on. Our second point is, the way is joyful multiplication. Chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go. Let's just stop there. In some ways, this is going to echo what we just studied the last time that we were together in chapter 9. Chapter 9, of course, is paralleled in Matthew chapter 9, and is called the limited commission because that's where Jesus first sends out the 12 apostles. Well, right here, it's called the larger commission. You say, well, why is that? Well, it's, he's sending out more guys, 72 more. So it's larger, okay? called the larger commission and then at the end there's the great commission when he sends all disciples into all nations now interestingly to me is Luke's use of numbers as well as Jesus's we understand that Jesus chose 12 apostles not by chance but for purpose he wanted to show that he was building a new kingdom. The old kingdom of Israel was based on the 12 sons of Jacob, which became the 12 tribes. Jesus says, hey, I'm building a new kingdom, a new Israel. And so I am going to choose the 12 apostles. Well, the number 72 has great significance as well. Notice right here that Luke gives us a clue. Every time Jesus sends out people to preach, he sends them out two by two. You say, well, why is that? Well, it's easy. So you don't chicken out. You know what I'm talking about? And so we get the clue right here. If you have the 12 apostles and you pair them up, you have six pairings. 
6 into 72 goes 12 times. In other words, each pairing of apostles now has 12 guys to continue to spread and proclaim the kingdom of God. Is that awesome? Multiplication was taking place. Very interesting also right here is the fact of what Jesus said. He tells the 72, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Well, why are they few? Well, look at the cost of following Jesus right above. The narrow road is few. Amen, guys? He says, but ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He says, you start praying for more workers. And we know in all of Luke's book, when there is prayer, something awesome is about to happen, right? And so you can kind of imagine, if you will, a Friday night devotional. Jesus gathers the 12. He gathers the 72. And, of course, his lesson is the harvest is plentiful. That was the title of his lesson. And he goes on his different points. One of his points was the workers are few. His last charge was we have got to ask the Lord of harvest to send out workers into his harvest field because the harvest is so plentiful. And so he got everybody down on their knees, and they started praying for more workers. Well, they had the last amen. They broke. They had the cookies and the water and the coffee in the back. <laughs> and about 15 minutes into the devotional, the fellowship of the devotional, Jesus goes, hey, guys, guys, I got an announcement. Your prayer has been answered. Everybody goes, awesome. He says, we prayed that the Lord would give us more workers. And he's answered our prayer. He says, go. You are the answer to your own prayer. <laughs> you are the workers. <laughs> well, he sends them on out. Amen, guys? In verse 3, we read, go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. It's risky. It's tough proclaiming the kingdom of God. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. This should sound familiar. This is the same charge as the limited commission. It's the same charge given in the larger commission. If a man of peace is there, your peace is to rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Why? They're making disciples. They need a Bible talk. They need a base from which to evangelize from. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat whatever set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. Well, we talked about that last time. You know, when a Jew would come out of a Gentile nation, he would stamp off his feet as a sign to the Gentile nation that God was not in that land. And likewise, the disciples, if a town or a village was unopened, they would stamp their feet to show that God was not with them. But if they welcomed them, they would say, the kingdom of God is near. Doesn't that bring a tingle to your spine right there? Now look what happens. Verse 12. I tell you, it'll be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Now, Sodom has got to be one of the most wicked of all towns of all time. But he goes on. Woe to you, Corazon, and woe to you, Bethesda. Well, what is Corazon and Bethesda? They're local towns there in Galilee. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it would be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, this is Jesus' hometown, and you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? Will you go to heaven? No. You'll be sent down to the depths. You'll be sent down to Hades. Well, now we find some very interesting things right here. We, we, we find, of course, Luke's fascination with threes. Remember, we had Peter, James, and John. We also had Mary, Joanna, and Susanna. Well, now we have Sodom, Tyre, and Sidon. These are three evil cities all the way through the Old Testament, and they're Gentile cities. So Jesus is once more bringing in the whole concept of 
Jew and Gentile, evangelizing the world. Amen, guys? And he contrasts that with Chorazon, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. These are the local cities around the Sea of Galilee right there where Jesus had the Galilean ministry, of course. And, of course, Capernaum, as I mentioned before, is Jesus, so to speak, home base. Now, he says right here, he says, man, if the miracle's done in these, quote, modern cities that I've been preaching in had been done in Sodom, Tyre, and Sidon, they'd have repented in sackcloth and ashes. And so he kind of compares the judgment. He says, you guys are worse than Sodom because you did not receive me. Now, it's kind of interesting right here. The little term that we take for granted says, if they would have seen these miracles, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. We use that phrase, but sometimes we don't really understand what it meant. The rabbinic teaching was simply this. If a man wanted to really show his repentance, and Jesus and John the Baptist both say, bring forth fruits of repentance. Are you with me right here? He said, if you want to show your repentance, according to the rabbinic teaching, you would repent in sackcloth and ashes. So what's, what would, what's that do? Well, you'd strip down to no clothes, and you'd put on sackcloth around your loins. Now, what is sackcloth? Well, it's usually made of goat hair or animal hair, and it represents the idea that you're lower than a human being. You're an animal. And the goat hair is very coarse. It's itchy and prickly. And of course, it's tied around the private area right there. And you're supposed to be sitting because when you sit, just like Jesus sat down at the right hand of God, it's a decision. It's a decision that you made, but sitting in sackcloth, it's a little uncomfortable. See, we want a comfortable repentance. There's no such thing as a comfortable repentance. Re repentance is prickly, it's itchy, and it's painful. In order for it to be repentance, you're mindful as you go through that process. Are you with me right here? And the ashes are just simply throwing up. The ashes and the dust coming upon you. You know, I wonder for many of us that sit here that have been studying the Bible for weeks, why we've not gotten baptized yet. It's because we don't want to repent in sackcloth and ashes. It's too uncomfortable. For some that have been coming to us that got off the way, that turned back, you've been studying the Word. But why haven't you come back to Jesus, the way, the truth, and life? Because the sackcloth is too uncomfortable, and you haven't sat. You've been thinking, but you haven't sat and made a decision in sackcloth and ashes. Let's move on. Verse 16, Jesus sums it up, and this is serious, guys. He who listens to you, he's talking to the 72, he who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. It's serious business when we don't repent. When you don't repent, you are rejecting God. Now look at this. Verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So they go out, they preach the word, and they come back, and they're so fired up during this time of accountability. Yes, there was accountability for the early disciples. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. They come on back, and all 72 are just flat fired up. And Jesus, Jesus himself says, hey, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Now, some people have brushed over this statement, but in actuality, either Jesus did or he didn't. It was a vision that Jesus saw. See, we need to understand that the conquest of Satan and his dominion is not a moment, but a process. And right here, 
At the beginning of disciple making, Luke makes the point, which is biblical and of Jesus, that at the point of disciple making, Satan's going to fall like lightning. It's going to be an extraordinary affair in the darkness of this world. Why? What's inferred right here is that God is tossing him out of heaven. And it's like lightning. It's bright. Everybody sees it. You cannot mistake when Satan falls like lightning, when disciples are having an impact. He says this process then takes you to Jerusalem where there's rejection and death on the cross where Jesus gains the victory over Satan. But then Satan is loosed and we ourselves know that Satan's still alive until the second coming when his final defeat is complete. Now, it's interesting also that they have power to overcome snakes and scorpions, all the poison of this world. They have power to overcome. And Jesus simply says, hey, you're fired up, amen. But you need to rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In other words, it's like a census implied right here is the idea that God knows your name. You should feel comfortable about it. Remember the TV show Cheers and the song that goes with it, a place where everybody knows your name and that's a cool place. Well, even cooler is when God knows your name because you got a relationship with God. And so right here, Jesus is saying, hey, it's awesome today that you return with joy and so many things have happened that are awesome. But you know, tomorrow, Maybe rejection. And you need to be simply rejoicing that your names are written in heaven. You know, today is our first anniversary service. Amen, guys? And it's a day of great rejoicing. A year ago, we got the final disciples on down. I think it was Colleen Antolanda finally got here. Of the 42-man mission team. 42 disciples from Portland. Now, a year later, with the six baptisms a day, God has blessed us with 101 baptisms in our first year. Is that awesome or not? <laughs> Equally awesome, with the restoration of, of Carrie and Robert today, it gives us exactly 60 restorations during that time. That's incredible. And Jesus, Jesus, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. But don't rejoice in that. Because tomorrow may be a day of great rejection. Just rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That you can, you can say, I know God. I know God. And God knows me. Let's say that together. I know God, and God knows me. Now, guys, we got to be more fired than that. <laughs> Let's try it together. Look, look at each other right here. Here we go. I know God, and God knows me. Tell me that doesn't fire you on up. See, that'll fire you up after 101 baptisms, but that'll also fire you up when you get rejected tomorrow. Because that is unchangeable by the grace of God. Keep reading. This, this next verse is fascinating. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Well, if you're full of something, that's all that there is. You're filled up. Jesus says, scriptures say he was full of joy. You know, think about it. Jesus never sinned. He sees all these guys coming back, understanding the way, understanding proclamation, and he's full of joy. It's my conviction that the happiest guy that ever lived was Jesus. And if we're following Jesus the way, what kind of people should we be? I know God, and God knows me. Let's keep reading. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned 
and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and knows whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, let's stop right there. So he's just now being in, in the big auditorium with the 72, and inferred is the 12. But Luke, if you pay careful attention to the text, is very precise about who is where. And he makes it very clear. If he's only addressing the apostles, he calls them the 12. If he's addressing the crowds, he says that. But when he says simply the disciples privately, that means it's the apostles and the women that were close to him. Remember that? Remember we had the same schematic on the men's side, Peter, James, and John, as we do with uh, Mary, Joanna, and Susanna. We only need one Jesus. We don't need a female Jesus. But we have to have a male ministry where men disciple men and a female ministry where women disciple women. Are you with me right here, guys? And so right here, he turns to his disciples privately and he, and he grabs the 12 and also the women that are following him. And look what he says. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see but didn't see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. Jesus pulls them aside. He says, guys, do you see the 72? It's happening. The multiplication of disciples. These people are in the way. Prophets and kings long to see what you see and hear what you hear. You know, Friday night in, in Phoenix, it was incredible. The place was on fire. When Chris and Sonia got on up there to be reinstated and then got up there and shared these incredibly powerful scriptures. You could just feel their hearts. And after the fellowship and after the lesson, I, 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 I pulled Matt aside and Chris aside. And I, guys, I just go, guys, do you see it? When you see a room of all sold out disciples. It's breathtaking. It's the very fulfillment of prophecy. And I say it to you even today. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see and hear what you hear. For prophets and kings and many that have fallen away and walked away from our former fellowship have longed to see what you see and hear what you hear. I hope you appreciate what you got. You know, sometimes even non-Christians appreciate more. It's kind of neat. Vic Jr. was sharing about sharing his faith on campus there at UCLA. And uh, I guess it's been probably a couple months ago that Ozar who plays on the football team there at UCLA as a quarterback, yeah. got baptized. And let's just say Ozar had a lot of stuff to change. <laughs> and and, and Vic, Vic was sharing with one of the guys on the team, and the guy that was on the team was a little bit, didn't really understand what this short Latin guy was coming at him for, you know? <laughs> and then he mentioned Ozar, and he says, Oh! You guys are the ones that have done magic in Ozar's life. And Vic goes, no, 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 that's God. See, that's how radical each conversion is. Granted, only a few are on the narrow road. But each is the very finger, spirit, and dare we say, the magic of God in making a new creation. How much more amazing is a whole group of people that share that? On, you know, truth be knowing, there's very few of us in here that are extraordinary from a world point of view. Maybe none. <laughs> but you know, people come in here and they go, oh, wow, this is extraordinary. Why? Because Jesus Christ has changed our lives and the love that we have 
for one another. Let's move on our passage. Our third point. The way of love is inspiration. The way of love's inspiration. You're going to love this, guys. Verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. This is, you know, right here, we know we're going to go through some bumpy territory. You, you just don't test Jesus. That's, 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 that you shouldn't do that. But he thought he could. Why? Because he was an expert in the law. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that is the question of all questions. Maybe you're here wanting to get it answered. We'll find out in a moment. What's written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? I love Jesus. You know, he gets a question, and he goes, well, let me ask you a question. Doesn't bother answering. Let me ask you a question. The guy answered, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you've answered correctly. Just like, do this and you'll live. Very interesting. He must have heard one of Jesus' sermons. And those two scriptures are from Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. And Jesus says, well, yeah, you right answer. Glad you saw the video. That's good. Do this. And you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. He's not taking this good. Luke wants to make that clear. He's not taking this well at all. So he wants to justify himself. He says, well, well who is my neighbor then? See, he, the trash was convicted out of him by the, already the scriptures that he knew. Think about that. All, the scriptures that you know right now, are you really living them out? This guy got uncomfortable by his own answer. <laughs> okay, well, how many neighbors do I have? What's the minimum I can do and still inherit eternal life? No. No. Jesus tells him a parable. See if you recognize this. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell in the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in love replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You know, right here is an unbelievably challenging parable. Now, it's set in the setting. Let's remember the setting. It's in the journey section. Jesus is the way on the road to Jerusalem. Yet, the parable starts out with a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's going the wrong way. The way is to Jerusalem. But this guy is going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Well, it so happens... That road is 17 miles long. It's one of the most dangerous roads, the Jericho Road, in all of Israel. It winds around a lot. It's filled with a lot of caves for robbers to be in. And one particular pass is literally called, so many people were killed there, it's called the Pass of Blood. It's a dangerous little pass. You also need to know that Jerusalem sits on a mountain 2,600 feet above sea level. But Jericho is 825 feet below sea level. So let's see if we can understand this parable a little bit. He talks about a man, we infer a Jew, was going down the wrong road from Jerusalem to Jericho, 
And when you go down the wrong road, you get beaten up by life. You're stripped of everything. You're naked. And then you're left for dead. He just says, half dead. But he's dead. You're dead spiritually. And so, this begs the question, well, who's going to help this guy? So, the first guy comes along, verse 31. A priest happened to be going down the same road. Uh-oh. Jerusalem's up here. Jericho's down here. Going down means, oh, no, he's going the wrong way as well. This priest, this keeper of the temple, who represents the official Jewish leadership is going the wrong way. And the Bible says that when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, in the Greek, it's a play of words. The other side, or opposite side, can be literally translated the against side. So he is against helping this guy. Jesus making a strong point. Well, then he brings out a Levite, kind of a temple assistant dude. Verse 32. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, oh, 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 now we get a little bit more hope. This time, the guy goes up to the guy. That means, aren't, aren't you getting a little bit more hope right now? He's getting, he sees the guy nude and bloody and just, just kind of stirring right there. And, and, and it just kind of fills you with a sense of, Good, this guy's gone up to him. He can see up, up close just how beaten up and injured he is. And then, then Jesus says, and he passed by on the against side. He didn't help. Now, it's not by chance. He had a priest and Levite, two officials in the Jewish leadership. We understand in Scripture, the witness of two people makes a statement of truth by using two officials. Remember who he's talking to? Another official, the teacher of the law, the expert in the law. Jesus is saying, it is sure. These two witnesses make it sure that the Jewish nation is against the way and going the wrong direction. He says, verse 33, but a Samaritan... Now, these guys are hated and disdained as, as half-breeds. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, well, there we go. There's our motif of journey again. He's traveling on the road. He's a traveler. He's in the way. As he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring out oil and wine. You know, it's... It's really incredible right here what happens. We have concrete compassion. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm really hurting for people. But they don't do anything. See, intentions pave the road to hell. A lot of people intend to care for people. A lot of people intend to be disciples. But that'll send you to hell. The way is where your intentions become actions. That's true heart and faith. Paul said it differently. He said in Galatians, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Woo! The only thing? Yeah, the only thing. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Well, what's this guy do? Well, number one, he comes to the guy. Number two, he binds his wounds. Well, that means he's got to take, the guy doesn't have any clothes or anything like that, so he's taking out his own clothes, he's ripping them on up, and he's binding all the wounds of this guy. He anoints him with oil and wine. Well, the oil is to soothe the pain and the wounds. The wine is to disinfect. 
He loads the man on the mule. That means now this guy's inconvenience. He's going to have to walk. He takes him to the inn. And we infer because he left the next day that he stays the night with this guy nursing him. He takes care of him with money. Our translation says two silver coins. The actual Greek says two denarii, which probably would keep someone in a cheaper inn for about three weeks. And tells the innkeeper, hey, if there's any more I can do, I'll come back and pay all the expenses. You know, there's no question this parable has incredible ramifications and parallels. Certainly there's Satan's attack on this guy that's going down the wrong way. Jesus represents the good Samaritan. Interesting choice. He's the one that's going to pay all and every expense to take care of this guy. The inn represents the church, where love and nurturing takes care of. And of course, if we are followers of the way, then that's our heart. It's that whenever we see a spiritually wounded, half-dead individual, we're going to go help that person. We're going to go help that person. It is also very interesting to me that in verse 37 afterwards, Jesus asks the question, Well, dude, which of these three do you think is a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? Tough question, huh? The guy couldn't even say Samaritan. He goes, the, 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 you, the one that had mercy on him. It was so hard. He couldn't even say Samaritan. His hate and disdain was that much. You know, one of the things that I love about the church here is your heart of hospitality. And one of, one of the couples that just over and over again gives that good old aloha Southern California spirit <laughs> is, of course, the Anakaeus. And, you know, I mean, we, we have... Three brothers just come on down last week, and Rob says, oh, yeah, Josh, Michael, David, just crash at my house. Oh, you have no money? Fine. We'll give you all the food you need, anything you need. My house is your house. You know, that's, that's, that's the Onikea's heart. And, you know, we, we had Alan just come down this week. I don't even know where Alan's staying, but I know someone's taking care of him. That's just what the church is all about. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's having people in your home, staying there, nursing them back to spiritual health. You know, the other thing that's so obvious is, is, is your heart for people that have gotten off the way. And I, I, the last time we were together, uh, it just really touched my heart to see Rebecca Martinez restored to the Lord. And I think that's because so many of you stayed in there with her, even when she was going the wrong way and didn't want to go the right way. You still kept loving her, even though she didn't want to be loved, wouldn't return those phone calls. But you kept loving her, and now she's our joyful sister again. Is that awesome? And today, I mean, with Carrie and Robert, huh, that, was, that was just awesome to see them coming back. You see, that's what it's all about, to be a Christian church, to be a church of Jesus. All of us are to be known primarily for our love, our love for God, our love for one another, and our love for the lost. In the last section of Luke 10, Jesus calls us to a very compelling decision. We simply read this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, well, well, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, 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 the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Do you sense any sibling tension right here? 
I mean, it's intense. Do you sense any bitterness? Any grumbling? Any anger? Sure. That's our sister Martha. What sometimes we don't really see is that in some way she's accusing Jesus. Jesus, aren't you sensitive enough to know that Mary is sitting there and she's, she's left me, she's not helping? Hey, do you know that insensitivity is a sin? Yes, husbands, it's a sin. And it'll block your prayers to God. 1 Peter 3, 7. But we know Jesus never sinned. And Jesus just calmly comes on back and just says, Martha, Martha. I, I, think, I think the Lord, he just kind of looked at her, just smiled, shook his head. Martha, Martha, Martha. Martha, this is you. This is the way you are. Martha, Martha, Martha. What the modern American has a difficult time seeing is the startling picture that's presented right here. First of all, verse 38 says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way. Oh, good. Now the disciples are in the way too. Amen, guys? And we know it's not only the 12, but the women as well. Amen. They're all in the way. They come to a village and they stop. So they're on the way. They stop off at Mary's house. Mary gets a little bit bitter and frustrated. But the thing that's startling is that we find that Mary is seated before the Lord. This would have blown any Jew away because no women were allowed to have formal rabbinic teaching, training, or we would call it discipling. And there was Mary, learning, seated, decided at the feet of Jesus. You know, Jesus makes it clear what Martha's problems were. You're worried and upset about many things. The text also adds, you're distracted. Now, at first we miss what the meaning is because, unfortunately, some of our Bibles do a poor job in translating this thing. The actual Greek says... Mary has chosen the better portion, or the good portion. So, right here is inferred something that's understand. Martha's preparing a physical meal, that portion. But Mary has chosen the good portion, a spiritual meal. And, of course, that brings to mind Deuteronomy 8.3. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. John says it another way, where Jesus says, My food, that which sustains me, is doing the will and finishing the work of the Father. And see, that was happening right here. Martha didn't see it. In the midst of like, all these preparations that had to be made, she was missing Jesus. There are a lot of people that get so busy in the church, they miss Jesus. As a matter of fact, they can get so busy in church that eventually it, their hearts get smaller and smaller and smaller. They lose their love for God, and then they wonder why then they start mixing up their priorities even further. And then eventually fall away. You know, priorities are clear in the Bible. We put Jesus first. You know, I appreciate uh, the young man that's going to be baptized today, Daryl Hall. Yeah. Kyle laid out what it meant to be a disciple. And one of the things was that you got to put God and the kingdom first. And we have men's midweek every other Wednesday night. And you're going to have to put that first. And so Daryl went to his boss and, and he says, hey, i got to have Wednesdays off. He says, well, why? He says, because I'm getting my life right and my church meets that night. And the boss said, amen. <laughs> but you know, the boss might have not said amen. What if he had said, no? Then he had to leave the job and put Christ first. 
It's all about God, his word, and his kingdom. These are our first priorities. I think about the people that have been blessed by these kinds of things. I, I think about Michael and Sharon Kirshner. Michael was vice president of General Mills. Bottom line, that's a cranking job. You get paid above minimum wage there. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he was told by the HR people that in the next 10 years, if he'd worked there, he'd be worth $50 million. $50 million. And yet, because there's no true discipling church right there, when they came and saw what God was doing in Portland and then here, and even after a visit, I believe, to Phoenix, he says, you know something? I'm going to have to leave my job for the sake of God and the kingdom. You see, Michael chose the good portion. Another brother that I think has inspired us all is Kyle Bethamiel. He knew that he and Joan needed to get trained for the ministry. And so he took out from the worth of his house, which wasn't worth all that much and is worth even less today, $20,000 to support them for a year. Except he hadn't counted on how expensive L.A. was. He ran out of money about a month ago. And he still had a couple more months of training. And he knew he had to finish it out. You know what Kyle's been doing? Washing cars. Washing cars. And I said, hey, that's good for you. Now you'll appreciate being full-time in the Lord. <laughs> and you know something, guys? You know, we have to have that spirit inside of us, whatever it takes. Our jobs are not our life. Overtime is not our life. Our million-dollar homes is not our life. We need to be in the way. See, the challenges today are pretty simple. The way is a narrow invitation. The way is joyful multiplication. And the way is love's inspiration. But we're brought by Jesus to make a choice right here. Number one, are we in the way, joyfully following Jesus? Or are we in the way, blocking the will of God? Thank you, and God bless.